All right, let's do this. Hey guys, it's Bob here, that Scottish drummer. And I'm really excited about this week's video because this is something I've been wanting to do now for a few months. I bought this here, which is the original iPad Pro back when it was released in 2015. And this month marks five years since the release of this iPad. And since I bought this iPad for reading charts in the pit and on stage, transcribing, you know, I work as a musician, so I wanted to do a five-year musician's review of the iPad Pro. I'm gonna share my experience and thoughts using this iPad over the past five years, so let's get into it. So yeah, it's hard to believe this iPad is now five years old. When I picked it up at the end of 2015, it was just really like an oversized iPod touch, but it's been so cool to watch it evolve over the years to where it currently stands, where I'm really happy with it, and where I think it should have been when it was originally released. With the latest release of iPadOS 14, this iPad is now running widgets, it's got external games controller support, it's got external drive support so I can plug in like my Samsung T5, and it's got external mouse and trackpad support, none of which were available upon release, so it's definitely evolved over time. So this review is going to be split up into three parts. We're going to have the hardware, I'm going to go over the software, and I'm going to touch on just three accessories. I'm going to do a whole separate video on my essential accessories for the iPad for musicians. So with that said, let's get into the hardware. So in typical Apple fashion, this is a really well-designed piece of hardware. I'll say right off the bat, this is the only iPad Pro that has a flush camera design, which means when you put it on the table, it can lie flat on the table. I only really use this camera for scanning documents and scanning sheet music. I would have appreciated the inclusion of a flash in here, but this one only has the camera, there's no flash on here. Much like, again, the new iPad Air doesn't have a flash, so you're only gonna get the flash on the expensive new Pros. Now with that said, the first and most noticeable thing you're gonna notice with this iPad is the massive 12.9 inch display. This was the first iPad to have that large of a display, and as a musician who was working every night reading charts, I knew this was gonna be absolutely perfect for what I wanted to do with it. And this iPad here actually packs more pixels than a brand new 2020 13 inch MacBook Pro. Although this iPad doesn't have the 120 Hz ProMotion display that you're gonna find on the new iPad Pros, it does have a variable refresh rate. So when you're only displaying charts on here, it will lower the refresh rate, which is gonna save you battery. A lot of people really love and vouch for that 120 Hz ProMotion display. I personally haven't used it. The 60 Hz looks just fine to me. And again, the new iPad Air comes with the 60 Hz, and so does the new iPhone 12 lineup. So it's by no means outdated. So with this almost 13 inch screen, it allows for a full size QWERTY keyboard and a decent size software keyboard in something like GarageBand. And if you're into GarageBand, Check out my friend Patrick over at the Garage Band Guide. He's making some really cool videos over there. This iPad features a laminated retina display, which means there's no air gap between the LCD and the glass, which makes it feel like the display is right under your fingertips, which in combination with the Apple Pencil, which I'll get to in a minute, is fantastic. And lastly, with the display, if you do use a Mac, you can actually use this as a wireless second monitor, which is really handy on the go. Another thing you might notice about this iPad is the fantastic speaker quality. This is down to the quad speaker array, so there's a speaker in each corner, which sounds absolutely fantastic, and to me, actually sounds better than my 2019 MacBook Pro. So in times like if you need to chart a song really quickly, and you don't have your headphones handy, these speakers absolutely get the job done. They're very full sounding, so you're not gonna miss out on any bass, any low end. You're gonna hear everything nice and clear, so you can chart a song, get the job done. But when you do need to plug your headphones in, this iPad actually has a headphone jack. It sounds silly to talk about that as a feature, but again, the newer devices are not coming with a headphone jack. Those new iPad Pros, new iPad Air, there is no headphone jack. And as musicians, you know the headphone jack is massively important. Now, because this iPad has the older design with the bezels top and bottom, you're gonna get Touch ID in the bezel at the bottom there, in the home button. And even though Face ID has been all the rage since iPhone 10, Touch ID is making a comeback in the new iPad Air and in the new iPhone SE, the 2020 version. Personally, I do love Touch ID, but I haven't used Face ID, so I can't compare. So once again, you're getting older, though not by any means outdated, hardware. So under the hood, this iPad is running Apple's own A9X processor, which is a dual core processor. The current iPads do, of course, have much more powerful chips. Each year, Apple brings one out that seems to improve on the last, usually they double, but this chip still handles day-to-day -day usage perfectly. The thing that really makes a difference on this iPad behind the scenes is that it has four gigabytes of RAM. 
which means it's able to run iPadOS 14 and hopefully iPadOS 15 really smoothly with no problems. As of now, the only iPad to have more RAM is the latest 2020 iPad Pro, which has six gigabyte. So for me personally going forward, I'm gonna want something that has more than four gigs. So I'm looking at six or eight gigabytes of RAM. So for me, there's no real need to update right now. Also under the hood on my model is 128 gigabytes of storage. Now this iPad launched with 32 gig and 128 gigabytes of storage. And I just knew 32 was gonna be a bit tight. So I opted for the 128, which I think most people should probably do. But since iPad OS 13, there's actually been external drive support. So you can plug in say a Samsung T5 or any sort of SSD or thumb drive, and you can work off of that. The last of the hardware features I wanna mention is the smart connector. This was the first iPad to launch with the smart connector and at launch, Apple unveiled a smart keyboard which just magnetically snaps on and runs off the battery from the iPad. I've never used one of these, but if you did need a keyboard on the go, then this would be a great solution. And it's also something else you don't have to worry about charging since it draws power from the iPad itself. Okay, so let's move on to software. Now this iPad launched with iOS 9, and here we are today at the end of 2020 running iPadOS 14. Over time, this has brought much stronger software, including a dedicated files app, making it much easier to just drag and drop files from app to app, external drive support, even games controller support for Xbox and PS4, and mouse and trackpad support. So we've definitely came a long way from iOS 9 iPadOS 13 was a big update because it changed the name from just iOS 12 to a dedicated iPadOS. And with that came full desktop browser support in Safari, as well as the mentioned mouse support. This year, iPadOS 14 has brought Scribble, a more compact version of Siri down in the corner, and a dumbed down version of the widgets from iOS 14. Hopefully the app library and the full version of the widgets will come from iOS to iPadOS soon. Now, because the iPad Air 2 was the oldest iPad to support iPadOS 14, and it has two gigabytes of RAM. So I believe this iPad here will see future updates to iPadOS 15, maybe even 16, down to the four gigabytes of RAM. And if that's the case, next year, the year after, you might see my six and seven year reviews. So starting from about late 2016, there was a year where I was without a computer. My old one broke, I just didn't wanna buy a new one. I had the iPad. So I decided I was gonna try and use the iPad as my computer, but I just ran into a lot of limitations with that. And a lot of that was due to the file system or the lack of file system at the time. So I would have split screen with like say Dropbox and Foursquare, which are some apps I'll get to in a minute. But I wanted to drag some files, some charts I'd been sent from Dropbox straight into Foursquare and it just wasn't working. I even remember getting pretty mad at the process because it took me forever. But this is a much smoother process today with most apps support and drag and drop. So now you can do what I originally wanted to do and you can drag from Dropbox straight over into Foursquare. You can even drag straight into a set list and drop it in the appropriate place in your set list, which is great. So still under software here, I wanna go over just a few apps that I do use on a regular basis with my iPad. While I was working on ships, we were performing every night and whether it was a show or cover band stuff, we were using Foursquare to view our music. I think it was only $9.99 when I first bought that a few years ago, and today it's $14.99, which isn't much more. And honestly, I think for the amount of features you're getting in the software, that that's a reasonable price. Good Notes is another app I previously used to chart up songs. I used this one because they had blank manuscript paper, but now Foursquare actually has blank manuscript paper, so you could just keep using the same app and not have to jump into another one. But I did enjoy using Good Notes, and it worked pretty well to export and then load into Foursquare. GarageBand comes free with the iPad, or if you have a Mac, it's free with that. So you can have a lot of fun in there. It's actually pretty powerful software. People seem to think of it as the little brother to Logic, which is very powerful. But GarageBand in its own is a powerful piece of software. I've been recording these drums behind me into there, which, uh, which I'm gonna do a video on soon. And that handles 10 mics on my drum kit with no problem at all. And if you do have Logic, you can actually export from GarageBand into Logic, open it there on your computer. So it makes for a pretty good on-the-go recording software on your iPad. Moving on from music into some other apps that I do use. I've used LumaFusion for a while. Not extensively, but I've had a lot of fun making some short videos in there. I do use my MacBook for these videos here that I'm share on YouTube. But LumaFusion's a lot of fun. It's cool to see a software built around touch 
versus on the computer. So if you don't have a computer, you can totally make your videos on the iPad alone. I know a lot of people are starting to do that on YouTube now. And this iPad can actually handle 4K. I watched the keynote recently uh, before I did this video to get some more, to get a refresh on it. And Phil Schiller announced that it could handle three streams of 4K. So I haven't actually tested out 4K on that, but it should handle it. Still on my video theme, I've used Keynote to make a lot of the thumbnails that you've seen here on YouTube, which runs great, especially in tandem with the Apple Pencil, you can color out the background quite easily. But I've just recently got Procreate, so that's the next one I'm going to talk about. I'm only just starting to dive into this one now, but it looks a lot more powerful than Keynote and it seems to be a lot easier to use than Keynote. I mean, it's made for a specific purpose versus Keynote is for slides, I was kind of using it for the wrong thing. but. Yeah, I'm excited to get more into Procreate and have some more fun with that. And for a bit of fun, I do jump on COD Mobile with my PS4 controller. It takes me back to when I was at college and I had my PS3. The guys would come around and we'd play some games on there. It's all the same maps, so it's a lot of fun. And on this 12.9 inch screen, it's pretty great. And the last app I'm going to talk about, it's kind of not an app, it's a service. It should be coming out this month and that is Apple One. So this is like a service that gives you access to a bunch of apps. Right now I use Apple Music and I pay for the family plan which is £15 a month and with Apple One I'm going to be paying double that, I'm going to be paying 30 but as well as Apple Music I'm going to get access to their TV Plus service, their News Plus, Apple Arcade and 2 terabytes of iCloud storage. So I think that's pretty good value for money. It really makes sense if you're locked in with Apple if you have an iPhone and a Mac and a tablet. I actually have an Android phone but I think it's still good value for money. Okay, so we're at the third point in the video here, which is accessories, and this isn't going to be in-depth, really. The first one I want to talk about is a fast charger. That might be surprising, you might have thought the first one was going to be the Apple Pencil, <laughs> but I think a fast charger is pretty much necessary if you have this large of an iPad. Out of the box, Apple supplied that 12 watt standard iPad charger, but with the size of battery in this thing, it just took forever to charge. Going back to when I was working on ships, I would have to charge this thing overnight which is like seven or eight hours, and even then, sometimes I'd wake up and it would not be fully charged. And I would run it down almost every day because I was doing some things on it through the afternoon, maybe rehearsing, going over things, maybe watching a video, and then we were performing for four hours at night, which would be reading charts. So if I ever needed to plug in on stage, I also had an external battery, but it could be plugged in, and it would just run at the same level. It wouldn't charge the battery, it would just stay at like 5% which made me pretty on edge because I don't want my iPad to die because I need that for the charts. So when I decided to upgrade my charger, it was in 2017, the only ones that you could get were from Apple. So I bought their 29 watt power adapter and their two meter USB-C to lightning cable. These were really expensive. I was in the US at the time. So the power adapter was $50 and the cable was $30. And I personally feel like these should have been included in the box. But the good news is, Apple have now opened up this fast charge into third party manufacturers. So you can now buy a USB-C to lightning cable made by the likes of Anchor and even a 20 watt power brick from the likes of Anchor as well. So you can fast charge pretty cheap now. And if you do have a MacBook, which I didn't at the time, because that's a USB-C power adapter, you can just get the USB-C to lightning cable and you're good to go. I recently ran a couple different charging tests here. I used my old 12 watt adapter and I used the 29 watt. And here's the results I got. So with the 12 watt adapter and the USB-A to lightning cable, it took almost seven hours to fully charge the iPad. But using Apple's 29 watt with the USB-C to lightning cable, it took less than three. And with the 29 watt adapter, you can actually use the iPad and it gets charged at the same time. So my second accessory is of course the Apple Pencil. For musicians, this is perfect for charting out songs or for writing out notation. And you can also have a lot of fun just using this in iPadOS 14 with the new Scribble feature. You can write in the URL bar, and you can use it pretty much anywhere now within the system, which is pretty cool. The best Apple Pencil alternative, the Logitech Crayon, unfortunately isn't compatible with this iPad, and neither are some of the cheaper alternatives to the Apple Pencil, so you're just gonna have to suck it up and buy the actual Apple Pencil if you want it to work. But you can get them secondhand, you could probably buy it refurbished and save some money there. And if you are writing a lot on the screen with this, it doesn't feel too good, just the glass, just the Apple Pencil straight on the glass. So you can check out these screen protectors by the likes of Paperlike or Belmond, which add a textured feel and it just really does feel more like paper. 
and the Apple Pencil charges via lightning, which is pretty handy, even if it does look very ridiculous sticking out the bottom of the iPad. And the third accessory I'm gonna to touch on is a wireless keyboard, mouse, or trackpad. With Apple's Magic Keyboard 2, you can navigate using all the gestures you would on screen without having to bring your hand up to touch the screen, which is really useful if you're having like a desk setup. Personally, I use the Logitech MX Keys and the MX Master 3 mouse, which I made a video on up here somewhere. I have previously used Apple's Magic Keyboard 2, Magic Trackpad 2, and their Magic Mouse. And one benefit to these is that they do all charge via lightning, which there's no arguing is very convenient. Even if the Magic Mouse has the worst charging design in tech. And no, you can't charge the Apple Pencil via the Magic Trackpad. Trust me, I tried. Okay, so we went over the three main points that I wanted to touch on in my review. But I do also want to do a short section here on the downfalls to this iPad. So the first and biggest is really that some apps are not optimized for this large of a screen. Even on a normal sized iPad, a 9.7 inch display, some iPhone apps just run blown up on there. So when you have a 12.9 inch display, that just looks absolutely ridiculous. And yes, I'm looking at you, Instagram. It's not such a big deal. It's just more bizarre than anything that these companies don't want to update their apps to work properly. Again, I've seen over time since I first bought this five years ago, the apps that I use adapt to utilize this bigger screen space. The second downfall would be size. Yes, I know this is the largest iPad, but the modern ones actually have a much smaller footprint. I think they're about 25% smaller because they've cut the bezels top and bottom, which must make a huge difference because this iPad actually has a bigger footprint than my 13 inch MacBook Pro. So for portability, it's of course not the smallest, it's a bit on the big side, but it is a great way to get that large screen. And like I just mentioned in the accessory section, this should have came with a fast charger. So the fact that it didn't come with a fast charger is another downfall to this. You have to buy that separately. Although like I said, now they're much cheaper and you could probably get one for less than 20 pounds, maybe 15. So it's not such a big deal now, but it was really expensive for me back in 2017. It was like $80 to fast charge. And that's it. There were the only three downfalls that I could really come up with for this iPad, which I think says a lot. And now after having used this for five years, I want to do some feature requests that I'd like to see in future software and hardware updates. So first of all, I'll talk about the hardware. I'd love to see a landscape orientation camera. Now more and more people are using this as what Apple want, which is a laptop replacement. So they have it sitting on their desk with a keyboard and a trackpad or a keyboard and mouse. So it doesn't make sense that the camera is off to the side because your videos just look skewed. It looks like you're not looking at the camera when you're looking directly at the screen. So I think Apple should either move the camera into landscape orientation or just add an additional camera there. I would much rather have two front-facing cameras on the iPad than two rear-facing cameras. And while we're at it, I'd like to see the logo on the rear change to be landscape as well and also the Apple startup logo. And this one is for all the musicians out there. Say it with me. Bring back the headphone jack. I know it's never gonna happen, but I would like to have it there for when I need it. I guess on the newer models, you can have a USB-C hub that does have a headphone jack in it. So that's not the end of the world, but it'd be nice to just have it right on there so you can use it when you're out and about. I do realize that wireless headphones are the future, but for audio professionals, wired is what everybody uses. So I feel like it should still be on their pro devices. And for software requests, I would love to see horizontal split screen. As it currently stands, split screen only works in landscape mode. But it'd be really cool if I could flip up my iPad to be this way and have the top section be something like say a YouTube video and the bottom section be me transcribing out what's happening in that video. I think that would be really useful and I don't think it'd be too difficult for them to implement that. So I'd love to see it. I also really, really want to see, and I know a lot of people do, full monitor support. Currently, you can mirror an iPad's display to a monitor, but because of the different aspect ratios, you get the black bars on the sides, which just does not look good. It's a waste of real estate space as well. So I'd love to see this in a future update, maybe iPadOS 15, or maybe even an update to 14. That would be really cool, and that would push it even closer to being that laptop replacement. So to finish off this video, should you buy this iPad today? Well, there's a few things to look at here and think about. For any musician, that 12.9 inch screen size is just incomparable to any other screen for reading charts. 
The size is pretty much just like A4 paper and there's no other iPads that compare to that. So on Apple's UK website, the latest 12.9 inch 2020 iPad Pro retails for £969. Compare that to £769 for the 11 inch model and you can see that you're paying a £200 premium just for that larger screen size. Now Apple's certified refurbished store is always changing, things are cycling what's available in there. But just a couple weeks ago they were selling the 2017 version of the 12.9 inch iPad and that was £779. Granted this was the 512 gigabyte variant but there was no option for less storage. Now if you start to look on the used marketplace, this iPad that I have, the first gen 12.9 inch iPad Pro, you can actually find this for around £300 or $300 on places like eBay and Facebook Marketplace. So for the price premium that this 12.9 inch iPad carries, there is no better deal than to buy a used version of the 2015 12.9 inch iPad Pro. So if you're a musician on a budget and you want to buy a tablet, I would highly recommend this one. Displaying charts and just using it for day-to-day -day use does not push the CPU or the GPU at all. So I imagine this iPad is going to run smoothly for years to come. If you are going to be utilizing your iPad for more heavy tasks, maybe some video editing, um, you probably should look at something newer, but you're gonna know yourself what's best for you. So that wraps up for this video, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this one. I had a lot of fun coming up with this video and the idea and what I was gonna talk about. And like I said, stay tuned for a future video on my essential iPad accessories for musicians. So thanks for watching, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one.